Okay, so you can go ahead if, uh, anytime you want. Okay, yeah. So, um, yeah, like, um, thank you so much for the the nice introduction. Thank you guys so much for, for you know, wanting to hear the research, something that I'm uh, very passionate about. I did just uh, defend my PhD on this topic, and I think that there's still a lot of very cool and interesting research um, at the intersection of uh, Bayesian machine learning uh, and adversarial learning, adversarial examples in particular. Um, so the basically the, the way that I aimed the talk was to first introduce why we should care about adversarial examples in the first place. Um, and then I'll define what adversarial robustness means for Bayesian machine learning. And again, I'll be focusing on neural networks throughout the talk. Um, and then lastly, I'll split up into what um, being Bayesian can do for robustness and what robustness can bring to Bayes. And lastly, I'll kind of motivate some, some uh, areas where I think uh, there's a lot of opportunity for research. So, um, let's talk about what an adversarial example is uh, at the very beginning of the talk, because it'll kind of set the, the tone for everything. So um, an adversarial example is uh, a test set input that um, has been slightly manipulated to force some kind of bad behavior. Uh, in this case, uh, case, a misclassification. So we have these two images. Uh, one is of a panda uh, and the other is, you know, almost identical in every way except for it's been changed by this color in every pixel and it's misclassified as a gibbon, which is a, a kind of monkey. Um, and this is obviously bad behavior from the network and it's something that uh, we have interest in studying, not only because there's bad behavior in this instance, but we can create adversarial examples for every test instance uh, for state of the art neural networks and I'll, I'll cover that a bit more later. Um, so why exactly should we care about adversarial examples is, is kind of the first thing question that I'm going to try and answer. So. Uh, changing a panda to a gibbon is maybe not so malicious, um, but there are lots of machine learning, you know, problems where it is safety critical. We do need to rely on our model to make robust and accurate predictions. So uh, just one example is self-driving cars. So here we have a semantic segmentation problem where essentially every pixel needs to be assigned a label. So it's been assigned a uh, road if it's purple, um, blue has been assigned to cars and green and yellow to different kinds of backgrounds. Um, and we have, uh, another perturbed input, and you can tell that maybe there's some granularity here, but it's very similar to the original input, um, except for this time, the neural network isn't necessarily going to see road, it's going to see something else, and, and that might change the action. And what it's been forced to see is this minion with its hands up. Um, and so obviously there's no really good way to act if you're a self-driving car, if you think that there's a car partially shaped like a minion with backgrounds. Um, that, you know, that's very difficult to reason about. And so we really need robustness in these cases. We can't have, uh, you know, something like this happening. Uh, and a very common kind of criticism of something like this is like, okay, sure, you can inject very precise noise um, into these neural networks and get them to misclassify, but how realistic is that? Like, it, can something like this happen? Um, and while I'm not going to focus on too many real life examples, I think it's a nice you know, thing to motivate uh, the, the study of adversarial examples. And that's things like um, these adversar adversarial patches. Um, and so this, rather than being some small noise that's placed over the image, uh, we have a sticker. And by placing this sticker in the image, rotated however you'd like, it changes the classification from whatever it was originally classified as, in this case, a banana, to a toaster, um, just with this small patch. And you can do this for any class feasibly. Um, the two that I think they found works best are uh, a toaster and a crab. Um, so somebody may then come along and say, well, okay, uh, this is realistic. This is a real threat model, but I can detect when I can, you know, design an object detector to detect these sorts of adversarial perturbations or adversarial patches. Um, and so there's even a, a more latent kind of threat model, which is these 3D printed and painted adversarial examples. So there's pretty much no way to know that this is an adversarial object, um, but this is a turtle that's been designed so that it's classified um, as a rifle. 
um, or uh, in some cases classified as other, but in no case was it classified correctly as a turtle, despite very obviously being a turtle to us. Um, so there are very realistic ways that adversarial examples can be injected into you know, prediction pipelines. And so there's a lot of reason to try and shore up and make sure that our models are adversarially robust. Um, and in general, like I said before, uh, we find that uh, the models aren't robust. So um, here, I just took a survey of some very recent transformers, and there's also some ResNet architectures. And you can see that with uh, some of the stronger attacks, um, zero per, we have 0% test set accuracy. What this means is that for Cypher 10 and for ImageNet, there isn't a single image in the test set that we can't force a misclassification for. So not only are these a bit worrisome, but they're very pervasive. Um, and so that's kind of the, the background and the reason why we care about studying adversarial examples. Because if you want to deploy your model in something like autonomous driving or something like uh, medical image classification where you're doing diagnosis, you really wanna make sure that you're not you know, making an error because errors can be quite costly. Um, so before I move on, are there any questions about kind of the background or any concerns about, about that? Okay, so then I guess what I'll do is I'll try and motivate the rules of the game. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of different things that I just showed you. Um, and I'll try and make this a bit more concrete. I'm not going to go into too much technical depth on the slides, but if you'd like me to, I'm more than more than happy to. Um, so there are going to be four necessary ingredients for kind of defining our adversarial setup. The first is a neural network, which is uh, parameterized by theta. Um, there's no theta in the slides. Sorry about that. It just says parameterized by. Uh, but parameterized by theta. Um, and in general, you could have any machine learning model here, but again, we're going to be focusing on neural networks. Uh, you need a feature vector x, uh, which we presume to be on the data manifold. Um, and then we have these two sets, which are kind of the crucial thing to defining your property, which is the thing you care about. Um, and that's t and s. So t is going to be a collection of perturbed inputs. Um, and S is going to be where we would like those inputs to be mapped by the neural network, so the correct behavior. So for example, in the case of the panda, um, we could say for every image that's only one pixel away from the current image, we want it to be classified as a panda with a certain confidence, for example, and then that would define our, our safe set and our, our input set. Um, so a, a little bit of a further word on exactly how that's modeled in the literature. So um, given these are, these are usually local properties, or I'm going to be talking about local properties um, today. And that means we're given um, an input, presumably, again, on the data manifold, and then some usually some distance metric. And the distance metric is going to define a ball um, that uh, kind of captures images we think are similar. So here, rather than a panda, we have a cat. Um, and then I've got three different norms. So the L2 norm is simply your Euclidean distance. So you have some n-dimensional sphere. And as long as the norm of that sphere, the radius of that sphere is less than 10, then we'll consider them uh, similar. And this is the adversarial example that you come up with. And it's classified as a traffic light with very high confidence. Um, the L-infinity norm or the SUP norm um, is the norm that says I can modify each pixel or each feature dimension by up to a bounded amount. In this case, it's 0 0.05, and then you come up with this adversarial example. Again, these are both indistinguishable, in my opinion. Um, and lastly, we have the L0 norm, also known as the Hamming distance. And this says that I can modify up to a certain number of pixels, in this case, 5,000, by an unbounded amount. I can change them as much as I'd like. Um, or typically, that's the, that's the case. You can you know, combine two of these, for example. You can have uh, joint norms and, and things like that. Um, but that's that's what a input set looks like. And then I'll quickly discuss kind of what output sets look like. So we, again, have a, a good understanding of the rules of the game. Um, and so that the output sets really depend on the task at hand and the property at hand. But I'll talk about classification regression because obviously they're the two that we work with most often. Um, so in classification, you know, we have this classification in the plane where we're trying to separate white dots from black dots. Um, and so we could draw a line to separate our um, given 
training inputs, which are drawn as solid dots. And then we have two test inputs, which are drawn as donuts. And we'd like to understand the robustness of these two or our, the robustness of our function with respect to these two. So the robustness of the classification function, again, like I've, I've mentioned before, is just ensuring that everywhere inside of this ball, everywhere inside of the input set T, um, the output is classified the same or is classified correctly. Um, and so for V2, we can see that because the classification boundary intersects the ball, we would say that this point here is an adversarial example. And then for regression, we usually define the output as some sort of sensitivity. Um, and this can again be in um, a Euclidean distance. It can be any metric really, but we have some uh, perturbation budget epsilon. And when we change the, the input, we don't, want to we don't want the output to change by more than a bounded amount delta. Um, so the two kind of definitions that you'll often see um, in terms of just what we're dealing with is an adversarial example exists if there exists any x prime in the set T such that x prime is mapped outside of the safe set, right? So we've induced an unsafe classification. Um, and then conversely, we say that a neural network is robust at a point if for every single x prime in T, x prime is mapped to the safe set. So, so that's it. Um, the, I've left T and S, like I've given examples, but T and S can generally be anything you want um, as long as they're compact sets. So T usually needs to be compact um, for certain regularity uh, reasons. And then usually we write S as a conjunction of linear constraints. Yeah. That's a little bit more detail than perhaps we need, but in case anybody is, is interested, that's that's the form that they take normally. So, um, oh. yes, was there a question? Hmm. Okay, so that's that's kind of how we define an adversarial example. And again, I'll, I'll highlight that using, uh, so this was using T as a single pixel magnitude change in the same way that we saw the, the Panda change. Um, for every single test input on transformers and on ResNets, we can, we can create an adversarial example. Um, so um, this is actually not the case uh, for Bayesian neural networks. So spoiler alert. Um, and, and we're gonna see exactly how that works and why that is in a second or some conjectures of why that is. But first we kind of need to take a step back and define adversarial robustness for Bayesian neural networks, uh, which is again, what my, my research uh, focuses on. So Bayesian neural networks, let's, I'll, I'll go through a few definitions of, of things here. So the way that a Bayesian neural network differs from a standard neural network is that we place a distribution, a prior distribution of our weights. And then rather than learning our, our posterior distribution, um, we use Bayes' rule to infer our posterior distribution. Um, so it just becomes uh, the product of the likelihood um, with our prior gives us an, a, a proportional to our posterior, or basically our posterior. Um, and then the way that we reason about new points is through an output distribution. So really in terms of adversarial robustness, the um, main difference, the thing that we care about or the, the thing that's gonna throw a wrench in our system is the fact that we have a posterior predictive distribution. There's a distribution over outputs. Um, also, whenever I condition on X and Y jointly for the rest of the talk, I'll use the uh, fancy D uh, to mean data set. So if you see that, that's what that is. Um, Okay, so again, this was our running example. We had some classification in the plane, and now we're going to look at what this picture is, uh, corresponds to in a Bayesian setting. Um, and that is rather than a single um, you know, function that we use to classify, we have an array of functions. We have an ensemble of models, um, and this ensemble of models has a corresponding probability distribution. So here, uh, just for simplicity, I've drawn out uh, a, probably a discrete mass function for our posterior as well as um, you know, five different functions that, that perfectly separate the, uh, the training data, but have different properties uh, with respect to the test data. So um, the, the most straightforward extension of uh, adversarial robustness to the Bayesian case is what we call probabilistic robustness. Um, so recall that our deterministic robustness definition is just that for every input inside of the allowed perturbation set, 
we have safe outputs. Um, and then the probabilistic version of this says, okay, what's the probability that I draw a theta such that the function induced by theta is robust? Um, and, and that's it. So we could walk through this computation for our given model and for example, for V4. So we want V4 to be robustly classified by one of our models. And we can see that for the yellow line, the green line, and the orange line, it's correctly classified and robustly correctly classified. That is everything inside of the, the ball is classified correctly. Um, and then for the uh, purple line, we wouldn't consider this robust because there's adversarial examples. And we wouldn't consider blue robust generally because it's incorrect. It's labeled incorrectly initially. So we have then three models which contribute to the probabilistic robustness notion. That's the yellow, green, and orange models. And together, they sum to give us a probabilistic robustness of 0.66. Um, so while this is a very straightforward extension of the deterministic robustness, it does have different semantic meaning, um, but it's still quite useful. So basically what probabilistic robustness is doing is it's helping us understand what the composition of our Bayesian model is with respect to adversary robustness. So this is uh, nice because we can reason about probabilistic robustness as a kind of uncertainty. Uh, and we'll see this later uh, in the talk. And also having a quantitative measure like this can be very helpful um, for training as well. So if you maximize probabilistic robustness, for example, uh, that can be a very strong thing to help with adversarial uh, robustness in Bayesian neural networks. Um, and then lastly, it can help us reason about priors. So if you have you know, prior A and prior B, and you want to know uh, which one you should select, if you have a strong bias for adversarial robustness, you could, you could test for this in your prior and then select the one that has, that has higher robustness. That's a, a smoother model, for example. Um, and we'll talk about applications and, and, and things like that in just a second. Um, the one thing that probabilistic robustness loses um, is this kind of correlation with uh, some bad outcome or some bad prediction that standard adversarial examples have. Um, so to regain that, we have to define a second notion of robustness for Bayesian neural networks. Uh, well, I guess before I go on to the second notion, does anybody have questions on probabilistic robustness? Okay. Um, so the second notion of robustness is decision robustness. So um, despite the fact that we have a posterior predictive distribution, uh, in Bayes, of course, we are still uh, concerned with making predictions and making uh, inferences on unseen test points. Uh, and there's Bayesian decision theory dedicated to this. Um, but here we have, for example, the empirical mean of all of our decision uh, boundaries, all of our classifiers. And this is how we would make a decision. Uh, we would have some decision surface, basically, that is the, the average of all of our models, uh, which is the result of Bayesian model averaging, uh, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a second. Um, and so this is um, decision robustness. So Again, we can recall deterministic robustness is that for every input in T, we want it to be mapped to the safe set of outputs. And the decision robustness of a, a Bayesian neural network model, uh, and again, this is skipping some decision theory, um, but is the expectation of our posterior predictive distribution. So if for every input X prime in T, we have that the expectation of the posterior predictive is an S, then we say that the Bayesian neural network is safe or decision safe. Um, so here, um, okay, that's exactly what I just said. But um, the nice thing about this property is that it directly recovers the, the adversarial robustness property, but in the Bayesian setting. Um, the, the final thing that I'll talk about just um, before we go into applications is quantitative robustness. So quantitative robustness uh, is a less of a binary predicate, um, but still kind of deals with, uh, can deal with decisions. So for example, you may be given an epsilon, so you know one pixel or two in the case of a panda, and then you want to compute the largest output change you can get from that input ball. Um, and then that output change would be called delta. Um, and it's good to remember epsilon and delta because I'll um, reference them in experiments uh, and things like that. So epsilon is the, the input space ball, delta being the, the computable output space ball. So how the largest change you can realize uh, from moving just inside of the epsilon ball. 
Um, and kind of just to give you an intuition, uh, delta and epsilon should be positively correlated. And we know, and of course, you know, delta is monotonically increasing uh, with epsilon. So as epsilon gets bigger, delta should get bigger. Uh, and of course, the intuition being that as I allow myself to make more and more of a change in the input space, I should see more and more of a change in the output space. Okay, so that's what uh, adversarial robustness looks like in a Bayesian context. Um, and so next I'm gonna go through why exactly we should care about adversarial robustness for Bayesian neural networks. Uh, but I'll pause one more time uh, for questions or, or comments if there are any. Hi, Master. I have a question. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, so yes, so previously when I deal with this, I usually do the things as you said, this decision uh, robustness, right? Okay. So, um, how, why would you be interested in this probabilistic uh, robustness at all? Yeah. So, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, so, there were, there's a couple nice reasons to, to care about probabilistic robustness. Um, one is that it, it is a, uh, a kind of robust measure of uncertainty and it helps us reason about kind of the composition of our posterior distribution. So, um, you know, you may have that your posterior variance on certain parameters, on certain variables is high, but the actual induced decisions aren't that separate. So, um, you know, your models could perform exactly the same on uh, on all you know a given so it could produce the same predictions for every different model um, given an adversarial input in which case um, you're going to be very certain about your adversarial classification so your misclassification will be very certain um, and so in this case you wouldn't be able to use something like predictive entropy uh, to detect out of distribution samples um, another uh, reason so kind of the, the other two reasons is um, it, it can be a nice term to maximize or minimize during training. So if you want to do optimization of robustness, um, working with your entire model composition and ensuring all of the individual particles that make up your Bayesian model are robust, you know, kind of gives you a stronger notion of robustness than just saying, oh, collectively, all of them are robust. Um, so yeah, that's, that's and I'll, I'll try and motivate uh, this a little bit more with some experiments in a, in a second as well. But does that kind of... Yeah, I'm trying to, uh, he, I'm trying to reason about the, uh, the relationship between probability robustness and uncertainty, but maybe I will wait uh, for your later uh, presentations, then maybe it will become clear. Yeah, so we can definitely relate uh, the two of them with, um, with some inequalities. So, I mean, you know, if, if you have, for example, uh, a hundred percent of your model, if your probabilistic robustness is 100%, then certainly your decision robustness will also be uh, 100%. There's really no way for your mean to, to change. Um, and then you can, there are certain inequalities we can get to that relate the two quantities. But yeah, this just kind of breaks it down into a model composition view rather than an emergent property of the, the posterior predictive. Okay, and I'll, I'll try and cover this a little bit more in a, a second. Okay. Um, okay. So, in trying to motivate why we should care about adversarial robustness for Bayesian neural networks, um, I'm gonna break it down into two directions. One, which is how being Bayesian actually improves robustness. So how this helps adversarial robustness and, and helps us reason more robustly. And the other is how robustness can actually help Bayes. So what insights can we get uh, from our into our Bayesian models by looking at um, adversarial robustness? So, um, right. The first one is, is an uncertainty uh, based thing. Oh, so sorry, we'll be talking about how Bayes helps robustness first, uh, and then I'll, I'll talk about the other side of the coin. Um, so uncertainty um, can heighten robustness by rejecting adversarial examples, by simply saying, uh, we don't know. Um, and this can kind of allow us to, for example, in the, in the case where we have a self-driving car and an adversarial example is uh, injected, we could turn over control to the user because we know that we don't know what's ahead of us on the road. Um, so here we have MNIST and we have a few different inference methods. Uh, this isn't uh, my paper, by the way. Um, I'll give um, links to, to all of the papers that I cite. Um, this one is, um, yeah, it's studied partic particularly uncertainty in adversarial examples. Um, but 
So even though we have that for every uh, approximate posterior, for every Bayesian neural network, we have that the robustness, the decision robustness, is very low pretty much immediately as we increase epsilon, we notice that the uh, uncertainty increases. Um, and when the uncertainty is high, if we produce an I don't know class, um, then we can say that we're robust with respect to the adversarial examples because we haven't actually made a misclassification. Um, and whether or not you declare yourself robust in that instance depends on how you define S. So for example, you could say S is defined as either the correct class or an I don't know classification, in which case this would be considered safe. Um, and actually we have, um, uh, this is my paper, we have shown that uh, in unknown scenarios, by reasoning about the uh, predictive uncertainty. So this is um, a, a notion very similar to the, um, sorry, to the probabilistic robustness. So here we're using a statistical estimate of probabilistic robustness in order to measure our uncertainty, um, as well as mutual information, which is uh, plotted down here. And we find that we're able to stop the car when the situation becomes unsafe or when we become too uncertain. Uh, so we have simply a car driving down the road. It's about 100 meters behind this white car. Um, and then as it approaches, if we don't uh, include any stopping due to uncertainty, we'll crash into the back of the car 100% of the time instead of performing a lane change, which is the, what we're supposed to do in kind of a, known, a more known location, more um, known scenario. Um, but given that we're in an unknown location, we're able to stop the car by using uh, a combination of mutual information and uh, probabilistic robustness. So that's that's one way that being Bayesian can help uncertainty. Um, the other is is probably one of the the more interesting uh, results uh, I think in the, this intersection, uh, which is this trade-off. So there is some protection from Bayesian model averaging uh, that you get. So um, to kind of explain what this point what this plot is, because it's a little bit difficult to grasp at first, each point. Um, here represents a different neural network, in this case, a deterministic neural network. And the neural network has a different architecture, so it could be a different width, a different depth, um, a different learning rate, just different hyperparameters. Um, and what we see, oh, and then over the entire um, test set, we check the accuracy as well as the quantitative robustness, which is one minus the softmax difference. So that's how much I can change the output of the neural network in terms of its uh, in terms of its softmax. So, what we see, and this is something that's demonstrated across uh, many many neural networks, so transformers, convolutional neural networks, etc., is um, that as you become more accurate, you become less robust. Um, so, by the time you've reached an accuracy of ninety five percent or or one hundred percent on the test set, you have almost no robustness. Um, and a lot of people conjecture that this is due to the fact that you've overfit your model. There's in some way you've learned a, a, spur a spurious correlation uh, that is being exploited by the adversary. Um, but when we do uh, exact inference, so, well, not exact inference, but when we perform good inference with BNNs, uh, we actually see the reverse trend is true. Um, so we notice that as our Bayesian model becomes more accurate, it subsequently becomes more robust. Um, and so essentially what we, uh, what we prove, so we'll, I'll talk about the conditions of this, um, but there's a, a paper where essentially we pin down this phenomena as being um, an emergent phenomena from the, uh, the property of Bayesian neural networks that their gradients of their loss function with respect to their input cancels out um, for, the, uh, for the posterior predictive. So what that means in short is that when you perform Bayesian model averaging, if you um, attack a Bayesian model, um, all of its gradients in terms of the directions that you should attack a particular input will cancel out and they'll give you zero. So by the time that you've got a very accurate Bayesian model, something that um, you know, is, has very good and well calibrated uncertainty, um, all of the classifiers are classifying on something different. And so all of the attacks are different and they'll end up averaging out to zero. Um, and so you won't, you won't have an adversarial attack or you, the adversary won't, uh, won't work. Um, so this is in this paper, robustness of Bayesian neural networks to gradient-based attacks. And um, some of the important assumptions are that we have infinite data. Um, so we, we have uh, perfect knowledge of the, the data manifold. 
um, and we have an uninformative uh, prior. Uh, and the other is that we can do um, exact inference. Uh, in this case, we have MNIST. Um, so certainly we don't have infinite data for MNIST, but we have enough that the, the problem is very well specified. Um, and then we can't do exact inference, but we do HMC to convergence uh, and with, with many models, and that turns out to be pretty, pretty good as well. Um, so there's that. And, and basically, this is another reason why we might consider using Bayesian neural networks if we're very sensitive to adversary robustness. So if you uh, would like to deploy in a self-driving car context or in a medical diagnosis. So not only do we have uncertainty from our Bayesian neural network that allows us to say, I don't know when we're too uncertain, but also there seems to be some kind of protection that's coming from the Bayesian model averaging that makes us more robust in the first place. Hi, Matthew, can I ask you a question about this? Yeah, please. So, okay, so when, okay, you assume you have infinite amount of data, right? But mm -hmm. usually in Bayesian modeling, right? So if you assume you have infinite amount of data, then the posterior will converge to a delta distribution, right? If you mm -hmm. make uh, the sort of like the right prior and the right likelihood assumptions, right? So in that mm -hmm. case, if you have a delta posterior, then essentially it just goes back to a determinative neural network, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's true. Um, if you did have, but I, I think the, the result would probably still hold. Um, because if we have, uh, if we do converge to this, this delta, um, then we have a model and, and we perform exact inference, then we certainly have a model which is correct on over the entire data manifold, in which case no adversarial examples would exist, even if you did have a, a gradient that was non-zero, uh, because any move that kept you on the data manifold would still be correct by virtue of you having perfect uh, inference and, and perfect knowledge of the manifold. Okay, so you are saying that, um, okay, assume, assume you, you have no model error, you make a very flexible in neural networks, right? So you're assuming that in the infinite uh, data limits, the network can actually learn, say, the uh, correct classification uh, function or something like that. Yeah, so, so I guess it, it, like it, in, in that case, it would. I don't think we explored that case uh, in the paper. We kind of assumed that we had uh, either a uniform or a very wide Gaussian prior and that we wouldn't converge to um, a, dis a delta distribution, but that we would still have um, some something in the posterior. And then the, the way that the actual proof technique works is we show that for any model um, that has a particular gradient, we have another model in our posterior with the same probability mass that has opposite gradient, so they should cancel out. Oh, okay, I see. So uh, maybe I should say it, it won't be so that I say delta diffusion, it should be, for example, that make sure of deltas, right? Because you have, yeah. say, um, neural networks that parameterize the same function, but with different weights right, by this kind of same symmetry, okay? Exactly. Okay, so, exactly. so okay, let me try to understand what you're saying. So. Uh, in the infinite limits, you are uh, basically your posterior only com converge to say the correct uh, functions with these symmetries, and you are saying that for each neural network within that set, you can actually find another say weight that have just the same function, but they are gradient in weights actually cancel out. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So okay. um, it's. So the, the actual, the gradient here isn't with respect to uh, the weight vector. So it's not the, the normal gradient we're taking. It's um, the gradient orthogonal to the data manifold with respect to the loss function or your error model. Um, so yeah, because that's how you would uh, attack uh, an input. So I didn't talk about methods for, for attacking um, Bayesian neural networks or neural networks, but uh, in general, the way that you do this with a gradient-based optimization is you, you have a loss function, of course, um, which specifies how good or bad your, your outputs are. And then for an input, we compute the gradient with respect of the input of the loss. So we want to change the input such that the loss changes maximally. Um, and it's it's this gradient that, that cancels out. Okay, okay, great, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Um, so uh, the third reason that I'll give for um, how Bayes kind of helps uh, adversarial examples is it helps us model our inductive biases. So before I talked about um, modeling inductive biases through the prior distribution, uh, but we actually have a, a pretty cool paper about modeling this through the likelihood. Um, and so I'll talk a bit about uh, this is the, the most technical I'll, I'll get in the talk um, in terms of the slides, I guess. But so we have um, sigmas are, are softmax with respect to y. And so we say our likelihood is a, a mixture 
of the softmax with respect to x, as well as the worst case softmax inside of an eta ball. So a ball parameterized by some, some number eta. And so uh, together, this gives us an adversarial likelihood because we're not just training uh, with a, a likelihood on a single point, so pictures of cats, but also the worst case picture of a cat inside of a ball as well. And so we'd like to improve our function with respect to this likelihood or our, our Bayesian model with, this, uh, with respect to this likelihood. Um, and an interesting kind of insight from this is that when we derive the error model for this likelihood, we actually get something that's different than what's normally done for adversarial training. Um, so adversarial training, uh, just for those who don't know, is where you inject adversarial signal into your training data to try and learn what's going on and try and uh, protect your model against adversarial examples. Um, and the loss that's used is just the sum of, of uh, cross entropies. And what we find is that you shouldn't actually do the sum of cross entropies. Instead, you should do, um, you shouldn't take the, you know, the log of the, sorry, the sum of the logs. Instead, you should take the log of the sums. Um, and so that's that's kind of a, an interesting insight. And then using this likelihood, we're able to train Bayesian neural network models, which are much more robust. Um, so here we have um, different posteriors. Um, and the, the star represents the accuracy of the posterior. And the height of the bar represents its uh, adversarial robustness. So this is standard training. Uh, and then we have two different training, robust training regimes. One is PGD, so where we inject PGD um, noise into training, into our likelihood. So we would inject uh, this kind of the worst case adversarial example here comes from uh, PGD. And the other is IBP, which gives us uh, an over approximation to the worst case. So we can guarantee that this is absolutely the worst case achievable. Um, and in that case, we have the bottom of the bar um, represents what we're able to certify or guarantee that the neural network is robust with respect to. Um, and I won't talk about this too much. I'll, I'll give um, a sketch of guarantees in, in the next section. Um, but the point is that by modeling, uh, by using adversarial examples, we can get much more robust posteriors. Um, so that, that's one reason. So I'm about to move on to uh, exactly how robustness helps Bayes rather than how Bayes helps robustness. Um, but before I do that, are there any more questions on, on that section? Okay, I'll try and be, I see that I've, I've already gone through 42 minutes of my time and I only have a, a few more words. So I'll try and be relatively quick and then we can, we can have some uh, discussion. Um, so, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about how robustness can help Bayes. And the, the first thing I think will address the, the question from before about why should we care about probabilistic robustness. Um, so in this case, I'm going to be measuring the adversarial robustness uh, with respect to different posteriors on these two images of uh, ones. Um, or I think I did um, 100 images, and then these were two examples, sorry. Um, and the idea is that we're going to be manipulating just this small patch of pixels uh, in an provably worst case way. So that's why we have a small patch. Uh, and we want to see how the, the posterior performs in terms of the probabilistic robustness. And we see for HMC and VI that as we increase epsilon, so as the magnitude that I'm able to manipulate each pixel increases, we have a smooth decrease in the... Um, in the worst case delta, right? And, and how big the change in the output is. And similar for um, when we decrease the, um, or sorry, this isn't a decrease in delta, this is a decrease in robustness. So as we increase epsilon, we see a decrease in robustness. Um, and similarly, as we decrease delta, so as the um, change in the output is allowed to be smaller, we see a smaller um, probability of robustness. Um, so basically this says you, the softmax output can change by at most 1% versus, or 0.01% uh, versus it can change by 5%. Um, and so as we allow that change to be smaller, more of the, uh, the, the adversary can reach that budget more easily. Does that make sense? It's a bit convoluted, but, but hopefully it, it kind of is, is okay. Um, but for Monte Carlo dropout, MCD, we see a completely different phenomenon with respect to um, probabilistic robustness. Um, basically, 
the Monte Carlo dropout posterior was either entirely robust or not. There was no smooth degradation of robustness. So essentially, what this allows us to reason about is that our model for this, for, you know, in terms of adversarial examples, could be very easily and quickly fooled. Um, and not just quickly fooled, but fooled convincingly. So we know that for HMC and VI, um, that as we increase our adversarial noise, um, we're going to see that um, the confidence slowly degrades. Whereas for Monte Carlo dropout, there's a steep drop off in that it was either completely, you know, classified correctly with 100% confidence or misclassified entirely with 100% confidence. Um, and so that kind of helps us reason about exactly where our calibrated uncertainty is with respect to adversarial examples and with respect to things, things that have been uh, very, you know, slightly modified. Um, so Another thing, uh, another kind of side effect, and this is of the robust training, so where kind of robustness can help Bayes, is it can help us with our out of distribution um, performance. So here we plot our predictive entropy on uh, first on MNIST and then on fashion MNIST. Um, and when we don't take into consideration adversarial examples during training, um, we see that the out of distribution training or the out of distribution examples does have higher predictive entropy. So the Bayesian neural network is, you know, doing something, has, has um, some uncertainty out of distribution. But with robust training, we get much, a much, uh, a much more pronounced difference between out of distribution entropy and in distribution entropy. So we can much more easily distinguish when we're not uh, within our, uh, the training distribution. And this is very nice just as a, as a property. This is something that, that we really want for, for Bayesian models for a lot of reasons. Um, so the last thing that adversarial robustness can kind of give or can, can promote in BNNs is, uh, is through verification. So um, one thing that a lot of people in the adversary robustness community care about is verification and proving the correct behavior of a system. Um, and so what we've been talking about for the, the most of the talk is finding an X prime in T such that we induce unsafe behavior. Um, and verification deals more with robustness and it says, okay, I can prove mathematically that for this property, it's always mapped to the safe space. Um, and the reason that this is nice for BNNs is if you went to a practitioner or a regulator and you said, oh, I have this problem and I'd like to employ this complicated Bayesian model, um, it's much more difficult to kind of sell that model uh, because it's more complex and we don't really know what's going on in the black box. Um, and so by using tools for verification, we can say, oh, I'd like to deploy my Bayesian model. And I know I have guarantees of its correct performance. Um, and we've got correctness guarantees for, for lots of different uh, BNNs. So this is um, a BNN trained on aircraft collision avoidance. So we ensure that the uh, collision avoidance system performs properly with respect to an array of specifications, excuse me, um, as well as uh, we have another paper that works on uh, reinforcement learning problems and proves over a finite time horizon that uh, the, the model performs correctly as well. Mm. Um, these are both small models um, and you can get things up to the size of MNIST, um, but beyond that, it's, it's rather difficult, um, both for just verification methods in general, but uh, Bayesian uh, verification kind of, that's, that's the state of the art right now, is we can guarantee, for example, a probabilistic safety of 0.7 um, across the entire test set of MNIST for a, a small uh, neural network trained on, on MNIST, like I said, sorry. Um, so yeah, those are the, the things that, um, adversarial robustness can do for Bayes. Um, and I'll, I was going to end with some, some research directions and some conjectures that I think would be good for research topics, but I'll, I'll pause here and see if there are any questions about those results and, and those things. So you thought your thing would be uh, the reason why say MC dropout has this kind of interesting discontinuity comparing mm -hmm. to let's say version inference and uh, uh, HMC. So, okay, when you say variation inference, you mean mean field, right? Yes. So, so this was a uh, uh, yeah mean field variational inference. So, based by backprop, was the particular algorithm. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so why you, do you have any intuition on why 
uh, and digital power result is Chris kind of say uh, the vastness in this this in continuity in terms of Rohan. Yeah. Um. So uh, it's it's kind of um tied to uh the fact that your actual ensemble the bayesian model average that you're doing contains models that think exactly alike so um basically what this is telling us is that the diversity and behavior of mc dropout models so models in the mc dropout ensemble um are all very similar behave very similar with respect to adversarial examples um on the other hand hmc and vi have a much more diverse ensemble of models again with respect to their adversarial performance and because of this we see a smooth degradation in the the probabilistic robustness rather than this sharp drop off um so what this is telling us is that you know basically our our ensemble our bayesian you know posterior for mc dropout is is not as diverse as we might like it to be especially when it comes to predicting on slightly out of distribution or, or slightly adversarial um inputs interesting so usually when you when i mean we have talking a lot about this kind of say diversity of neural networks in the uh beta neural networks right so um usually um we usually think that for version inference because you don't you only capture a single mode right in the loss surface we kind of don't see like the version inference networks uh the ensemble in the version inference on, on, on distribution will be that diverse and uh, um i think there are uh some other papers that tries to show that oh maybe the uh, diversity for uh, version inference is not that great, especially when compared, mm. let's say, to MC dropout. But um, you, you are suggesting the uh, other way around. Yeah. So um, I will let me. Uh, this this ties nicely into uh, kind of what I was going to to talk about next, which is um, so there is kind of this this very interesting trend between kind of a more approximate inference um and kind of worst adversarial performance um so i will say in that example with mc dropout the dropout rate was um maybe 10 percent. so we weren't doing anything okay. like concrete dropout or um tuning the the dropout parameters this was just a, a fixed dropout rate was selected we trained and then performed uh, monte carlo inference so um it was just not not a, a knock per se on uh, MC dropout, but just showing that oh you know if you have a a network which has low diversity, um, and of course there are many um, you know single mode approximations uh, to the posterior which do have you know very low diversity. So for example, we see uh, swag. I'm not sure if you are all familiar with uh, the landscape of different approximate inference methods, but there's a lot out there. Um, I'll try and describe. Uh, some of these algorithms so that you can kind of have an intuition. Um, but SWAG is, is stands for Stochastic Weight Averaging Gaussian. Um, and basically what you do is, is as you're going along with SGD, um, you're updating your parameters and you take the last n iterates. So the last n things that you saw when you did SGD, you fit a Gaussian distribution to those samples. And then you take this as a variational approximation to your posterior. Um, of course, there is no prior distribution here. Um, and there isn't, I mean, okay, maybe you could, you could try and do a probabilistic interpretation of the learning rate or something like that as a, as a prior. Um, and of course you, you have the inductive biases encoded in the architecture. So there is kind of a, an implicit prior, but there's no weight regularization happening, for example. Um, and so here we have a very, uh, a model with poor diversity, which leads to kind of a lower adversary robustness, even though the model has very strong performance. Uh, so it's, it's got nearly perfect test set accuracy on MNIST, its adversary robustness is low. And as we increase kind of the fidelity of our approximate inference method, we also see that there's a, a large uptick in adversary robustness leading all the way up to HMC, which is both very accurate. I mean, you take a hit in terms of accuracy because it's difficult to perform uh, HMC even on MNIST, but you have a, a strong robustness just naturally without any kind of adversarial training. Um, and so this is something that's interesting and it's a phenomena that you know we conjecture at in the, the paper on gradient-based attacks, um, but which uh, there isn't really a, a strong like full theoretical link as to model diver the link between model diversity and robustness. And can robustness help tell us something about our model diversity and can it help us uh, develop better uh, inference methods? Um, so 
Uh, again, there's um, if you look at VI instead of HMC with the result of uh, protection from Bayesian model averaging, you see kind of the same result, but not nearly to the same effect. So there is a positive correlation you know, if you cut off the, the higher end, but then the variational inference method tends to overfit. And we see that at the higher ends of accuracy, we again have a degradation in robust performance. Um, so there is a lot of research here and, and some interesting questions to be asked about exactly what's going on with model diversity in these things. I mean, we have the theoretical guide that tells us, well, if we have perfect model diversity, um, so for every model with an input gradient going this way, we have one that goes the opposite way. Um, then we have good robustness. But if we do a single mode approximation, maybe we don't have this and we're not as robust. So understanding more about this kind of model diversity might help us you know, make better decisions about how we create our posterior, right? So is there a set of models or a subset of models, some kind of underlying behavior that we can get by looking at adversarial examples that we might not be able to get just looking at clean data? Um, so that's that's one research direction. Um, another one that I think is is very interesting that there's um, a couple papers in is adversarial robust priors. So I talked about how we can encode adversarial robustness into the likelihood. Um, but obviously, um, we have uh, in, in Bayesian learning, we have a prior, which is going to try and um, bias us towards models that we think will do well on our task. Um, and if we have knowledge that our task is, for example, medical image diagnosis or self-driving cars, we know that we want some kind of smoothness. We don't want our model to change very rapidly. Um, and if we could, um, if we could, sorry, compose this as a prior uh, in weight space for a Bayesian neural network, then we would have much more robust inference in theory. But this is rather challenging in practice. So there are two works here, which I think um, kind of go in the right direction. One is um, output constrained uh, priors for Bayesian neural networks. So basically they um, have a posterior or a prior mass function over uh, weights that they've tested and know satisfy the specification. And the other um, isn't so much trying to select systematically a prior, but is instead looking at the Lipschitz continuity of the prior and saying, oh, look, this induces Lipschitz continuity in the posterior just like we would want. Um, so I think there is a lot of room in, in this area uh, to do some very cool research. Um, and, and this is kind of where I would start if you wanted to go in that direction. Uh, and the last uh, kind of research um, direction that I, I think would be very cool is we have these, <clears throat> we, we, I do a lot of verification. That's where my background is. So uh, this is something that I think is particularly interesting and that's verifying adversarial properties of interest. So there's recently this paper from uh, DeepMind uh, in this year's NeurIPS, which um, kind of extends the, the framework we have for verification of Bayesian neural networks, um, not just to ensuring correct classification, but also uncertain classification. Um, so, you know, the out of, uh, verifying by selecting a proper S and T that for an out of distribution input or for a collection of out of, di out of distribution inputs, you are uncertain. Um, and this can kind of be viewed as a more comprehensive analysis of the performance of your network, not only ensuring that for in distribution points you're correct, but for out of, distrib out of distribution inputs you're uncertain, uh, which is what we really want from our Bayesian posteriors. Uh, and there's definitely a lot of work to be done here, but they do have uh, a guaranteed area under the curve um, metric that they, they can prove is, is safe. Um, and if you wanted to go in that direction, uh, the three papers that I would uh, probably look at is, is their paper, um, verifying probabilistic specifications. And then also we have a couple papers, one doing a verification for reinforcement learning loops um, and the other doing um, verification of correctness uh, and probabilistic safety. Um, so yeah, and that kind of concludes uh, everything I had for you guys uh, today. So thank you so much for, for listening and, and letting me present. Hopefully things were clear enough. I did try and get through a lot of uh, work at once and I feel like I, I didn't quite hit some of them. So if you do have questions, please let me know. It's probably because I didn't go into enough detail. Uh, it probably has nothing to do with you. Know, you. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Okay.